Hey, Dr. Catherine Ramslin is here today to talk about her work in forensic psychology. She's written over 70 books of which I've read one, uh, Confessions of a Serial Killer about the BTK Killer. And she's also part of the series on A&E based on that book, and both are great. And we're gonna talk about that, plus we're gonna talk about red flags for serial killers and mass murderers, psychopaths and sociopaths, if there are any active serial killers out there right now, and much, much more. Stay right there. Please welcome Dr. Catherine Ramslin. You prefer just Catherine? Catherine's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm so amazed by all the work that you've done, how many degrees you have, how many books you've written. I don't, I mean, it's, seriously, it's inspiring. I had to look, I was like, okay, who has more books, you or Stephen King? You have 68, Stephen King only has like 64. I actually have 69 now. Oh, 69. <laughs> Is that... And I just signed for 70, 71 and 72. So yeah, I'm on my way. <laughs> wow. So the latest one that's out is the BTK one, right? Or the other one's coming oh, no. out in August? Oh, there's been others since him. That that one came out in 2016 as a hardcover, 2017 as a paperback, uh, recently as an audiobook, but that's I've had some since then. Oh my god. <laughs> what is the okay, what is the most recent one then? The most well, pandemic hurt. Uh, the most recent one is coming out this August, and then before that, there was How to Catch a Killer, um, which came out from Sterling, and that's th thirty cases of serial killers who got caught and how they got caught. Oh, okay. I'll have to. I have to check that one out. Yeah, these are all. I wanted to read as many as I could. I got one. I got that's about as many as I could get. <laughs> okay. BTK one, and then I watched the series about it too. Um, that, that how to catch a serial killer. And that sounds really interesting because it seems like now there's not very many serial killers because of the DNA stuff. It's, it's hard for them to repeat killing, right? That's not true. They don't think about stuff like that. They, they often think they're immune to capture. They're smart. They know how to take precautions. And also their killing is not about logic. I know figuring things out. It's compelled by, you know, whatever, whatever's motivating them. And they do believe they can get away with it. And you know what? We we don't know who everybody is. <laughs> so there still are certainly series of crimes that we don't have we have not arrested anyone for. So that's not that wouldn't be a reason why why they've diminished. I know people are making that argument, but I don't see that that's true. So you think there's some serial killers that are out there right now that just haven't been caught? Yeah, I mean, look at look at what happened with Sam Little. A couple of years ago, he, he came out and said he'd been killing for decades to the tune of 93 victims. We didn't know anything about him during that time. He was very clever about the types of victims he picked, which he knew would be under the radar, mostly um, black, female, drug addicted prostitutes or runaways or people who got off buses or, you know, people that, that they just wouldn't command very many resources for an investigation. So, and he was right. And he then confessed and turns out he had been killing people. And so there were a number of unsolved cold cases attributed to him. They did not like 93 to him, but they linked over 50. Is that, was that one in Ohio or where was that? He was, he was all over the country. Oh, okay. somewhere, in, somewhere in Ohio, Cleveland. Okay. Um, but California, Texas, Florida, he was in a lot of places. I had on somebody from uh, this this website called the Murder Accountability Project, and we we spent a lot of the episode talking about the Chicago Strangler because that seems to be one. He thinks there is a serial killer in Chicago that, it's, that all these strangulations happening there are linked to one person. Maybe. <laughs> Do you have you thoughts know. on that? Have you studied that case at all? You know, it, it, until we get the person and find out if we can, unless there's DNA that links them. If it's, if you're just looking at behavior or geography, something like that, maybe We're, it's speculation. Even, yeah. even Jack the Ripper with the so-called canonical five victims, they might not all be linked either. Really? Well, you thought yeah. that Jack the Ripper could also be way uh, more victims too, right? Is that more a or less? Okay. Or no Jack the Ripper at all. Yeah. 
<laughs> just never know. Yeah, this guy has like all this data and he, he looks at these data points and that's what he's coming to that conclusion. So data points always need interpretation. Sure. Yeah. Nothing's uh, like you said, until we catch the person, we don't know for right. sure. But the DNA definitely does help a lot, right? It does, because that makes a link among scenes and among victims. If you if you have victims who knew each other or you have the same kind of victim in the same kind of um, trade, for example, sex work or or they all worked in the same gym or, you know, something like that, you have you have more likelihood, but it's all probability analysis and probability analysis has an error rate and the size of that error rate is all of, is related to how much you're speculating. So when somebody says there's a serial killer that will link all these crimes, like the trucker idea that there's all these truck routes across the country linked to all these either missing or murdered women, maybe. <laughs> but hmm. until we catch them and can definitively place them there, there's an error rate. Mm -hmm. And we could be wrong. So I don't like saying, yeah, that, that looks good. That's a serial killer. I, I don't know that. Right. Do you think that the, the killers now are watching these crime shows and things and trying to pick up uh, tips and tricks on how to not get caught? They've always been doing that. BTK, uh, Dennis Rader, went to criminal justice classes. Yeah. And he was right. in a classroom with one of the pathologists who was talking about one of the victims in the autopsy. There he was sitting there listening to his own work. That's creepy. So yeah. one of the things he did was he he turned the heat up in the rooms. Did that actually even do anything? Was he only did that thing? once. Oh, I mean, okay. he, he'd read novels. <laughs> yeah. Something sounded interesting. He'd try it. He only did that once. Because, um, yeah, that boils time since death estimates. Okay, and so it does do something, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, but it didn't wouldn't have helped in that case. That was the Oteros wouldn't have helped because the younger kids went to school. Their parents were alive when they came home. They found their parents dead. So there's yeah. a very small time frame in there. It's it's really not going to matter that much. And it honestly, it was just something he was trying, not because he was so clever, but he read about it and thought, let me do this. Right. But that's kind of a myth that people think that these serial killers are like these Hannibal Lecter's really smart people. That's typically not the case. Most of them are below average intelligence, right? Well, I mean, we're, we're talking about, we have documented over 5,000 serial killers. So you're, the IQ is going to span similar to that population as it does to the population at large. There are some who've been uh, street smart, but not IQ smart. There have been some IQ smart, but not street smart. Many of them are just average or even lower than average. But look at um, Gary Ridgway, the Greenway, the Green River Killer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his IQ was definitely low average. And yet he got away with at least 49, if not more, murders because he was street smart. He was clever. Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, because I wondered about that. Like, I, I re read that, too, that his uh, IQ was below average. But, yeah, he's yeah. one of the most prolific. So and, he got, and he beat an, a, a polygraph. That, oh, that's right. Yeah. How did he do that? <laughs> when you believe your own narrative, when you're sh sure about your own story, it doesn't register. Polygraphs only, they're, they're taking body readings. And it's not, they're not truth detectors or lie detectors. They're they read physiological reactions to things. And if, if, you know, if he's a psychopath, he, he get, he already has low physiological arousal in the first place. If he's practiced, if he there, you know, I don't want to teach people how to be polygraphs. No, I'm not no, going to go into all that here, but there are certainly are ways to do it. And um, if he's done any, any looking it up at all, he yeah. No. Now there was no internet in the 1980s sure. for someone like him to to look stuff up. But um, certainly, if you you lie easily, because they they have no investment in truth, they have investment only in getting away with doing what they want to do. So if you have no investment in truth, it's not going to register in your body as right, a like lie. 
Because this is the the way the lie detectors work is they they register like anxiety and guilt, and it, he did not feel guilt or anxiety about no. his crimes. You no, know, he was helping the police. Is what he th- yeah. So what his <laughs> defense was yeah because he, he thought sex well workers. eliminating yeah eliminating sex workers that was what the police wanted. He was doing yeah. the right thing. And a majority of the serial killers are psychopaths. Or was it? Tell me the difference between psychopath and sociopath. Is is I always confuse those two. Well, first, let's talk about the word psycho covers two different distinct uh, populations, psychotic individuals and psychopathic individuals. Psychotic individuals are uh, disconnected from reality. Their thoughts are disordered. We have some serial killers who were psychotic. Um, Now, if they also are psychopaths, maybe something like a schizopath, they're really dangerous because they have disordered thinking on top of no remorse and no conscience and nothing like that. The sociopath is an older word that comes from the 1950s and 60s. Some people still like to use it. Most uh, professionals aren't really using it. There's no diagnostic instrument for it. What, what the diagnostic instrument is for is antisocial personality disorder. So and, and psychopathy also has a diagnostic instrument, but different countries use different things. So our country tends to use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, which is antisocial personality disorder. Okay. They don't talk about psychopaths unless they distinctly use the psychopathy checklist. But that ch- psychopathy checklist is used in a lot of other countries I, pr- I personally prefer psychopath. There's not really a distinction because there's no diagnostic instrument for sociopath. Okay. It's an older word. It, do- okay. it, just, it, is, it doesn't mean much to me. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because I read a book called uh, The Sociopath Next Door, and this was all about how like- Yeah, I think she it took said- all the psychopath stuff. <laughs> okay, because it said like one in six people are sociopath, which, and it sounds scary, but then, the, then she explains that um, you know, like people like a surgeon or people in high military uh, p- p- uh, jobs and things, they need to have that disconnect from what they're doing. You if can you're have a that surgeon, disconnect. you can have that disconnect without being psychopathic. Right. That's called right. a clinical approach to things. I have it when I'm when I'm working with with clients or even with serial killers. So that that doesn't make me a psychopath or a sociopath. That is a that's a, a mental state that's you know, you're doing your work, it's clinical. And if you don't have a diagnostic instrument for sociopath, what does it even mean? Doesn't mean anything. Now, there are some people who make the claim, a psychopath is born, a sociopath is made. That's one, that's one of the distinctions that kind of makes some sense, because the the person who's a sociopath might have had child abuse, um, neglect, things like that, that they're reacting to and they're developing that resentment and that ability to harm others with no remorse that is typical of a psychopath. And and for psychopaths, we certainly have a lot of brain um, scans that tell us their brain structures are different. So they're born into this condition, which doesn't make them first at all criminals, doesn't make them serial killers or murderers by any stretch of the imagination. Most are not criminals, but they do have that psychopathic condition of having very shallow emotions, no um, no real connection aside from whatever serves their purpose because they're pretty narcissistic, egocentric. Um, they don't have remorse for harming others. They tend to be manipulative and parasitic and all the things that we use as measures of psychopathy, but that doesn't necessarily make them criminals. They could just get in a relationship, lie to you with ease, take your resources, uh, break promises, things like that. They're not criminals, but they're still not fun to be with. So how, what percentage of the population are we talking about would share that similar kind of brain scan if we looked at 100 people? Uh, Robert Hare, who's the psychop- the premier psychopathy researcher, says it's one in a hundred. Um, I don't. It could be in a different different occupations. You're going to find it to be higher, like CEOs, mm-hmm. politicians, people who 
the psychopaths tend to like power. They like money. They like the things that are uh, exciting because they have low physiological arousal. And this, this arouses them. This is something that makes life into a game. So you'll find more of them in certain types of professions than in others. Um, they don't tend to gravitate toward low-key, caring, um, self sacrificial types of, of things because that just doesn't interest them unless they can see a way to enrich themselves from it. Hmm. Um, so, so you're going to find that that one percent to be different in different occupations. Um, how they come up with one percent, I don't know. I don't, I've never made any sense of that personally. Hmm. But it's possible yes. that there's a lot of people that maybe have this kind of predisposition, but they channel it and go into a more healthier route. Well, like a and, also, and also there's a theory called almost a psychopath. <laughs> so so you're, you're on a continuum and you're closer to the, you know, one pole than the other. So you're not really quite come up on the high on the psychopathy checklist to be diagnosed as a psychopath, but you're, you're almost there. Hmm. All right. So that gets finely nuanced. And, and certainly um, we have other personality issues like narcissistic personality disorder, where they're highly narcissistic, bordering on psychopathic. Um, they're, they're just, you know, arrested development, juvenile or infantile types of people that doesn't necessarily make them psychopaths i like to use the word psychopathic which is more of an adjective to talk about the kind of behavior we see especially if if someone has not been formally diagnosed as a psychopath such as dennis rader never was formally diagnosed as a psychopath because nobody used the psychopathy checklist and yet does he exhibit many of these behaviors yes he does so he would I would say he's psychopathic on, mm -hmm. you know, on his bad days, because, because he likes to talk about being a good person who did some bad things. <laughs> so it depends, on, on it? Yeah. it depends on what day you get him on. Yeah. Well, you mentioned narcissism. That's an interesting one, because do you feel like with our society, that is getting worse like that that seems to be everybody wants to be an instagram model everybody's a TikTok star doesn't mean that they're all going to be psychopaths or serial killers but it is something that it seems concerning to me does that something is that something well, that's concerning to you i mean narcissism is present in all of us because it's a sure. survival mechanism we are going to be thinking all about our own preservation first and our own interests first no matter what um unless you have to rescue your child or something like that but typically we're going to have our own perspective as our first point into the world. That's that's a, a degree of narcissism. It's not unhealthy. It gets unhealthy when it, when those people become that really believe they are the center of everything and are the most important person in the room and they should be treated uh, in a special way. They're entitled to things. Um, and and yeah, our society has grown to the point of uh, really supporting that where those tiktokers are becoming influencers and they're getting vast amounts of of gifts and and special treatment and whatnot but you know once they stop being influencers they take a big hard fall because they're not so special and then you get depression and suicide attempts and you know um nasty games with others trying to undermine them and you know it's it's a problem and i think i think if people really believe their narrative when they're on these various videos and you know websites where they, they are so very important and entitled to special treatment they're setting themselves up really so do you think that's going to get worse as like you're saying like when these TikTok stars it, when they start to fall off and not maybe not be as popular or they get older or whatever then they're going to suffer some major health problems mental health problems i think they will yeah because they don't they're, they're not being guided in having any perspective on it those who have perspective on it fine they know that this is something that's working for them right now it's gonna be a fad it's gonna last only so long but you know the pressure is on really from from advertisers they're the ones who are looking for someone who make a difference who sell their product and and bring in the money 
And as long as that pressure is on, and it always will be in our society, you're always going to have people set up to, you know, be the, the face that will bring in the funds and those people could get used, exploited, and eventually dumped. And unless they have some perspective on it, where they have some, an emotionally healthy approach to it, uh, I think they're going to be very surprised that this isn't going to last their whole lives. So the emotional, healthy perspective would just be to maybe be grateful and take it like one with a grain of salt, knowing that this is just something that's fleeting and probably won't last forever. Yeah. And if it does last forever, you're so much the better, right? Because you weren't expecting it to. And and it, it's a nice surprise. But um, more often than not, it's not going to last. And you're, you should be prepared. So, mm -hmm. yeah, emotionally healthy is recognizing it as a pocket of your life and not your whole identity. Okay. Yeah. That's a fascinating uh, little tangent that we just, I just, that, that's such an interesting part of society right now. I feel like is with the, the narcissism. So that's interesting to hear your take on that. Yeah. And yeah. also, I mean, you, you are seeing it. Somebody asked me today, what's, you know, I started all this stuff back in the nineties and when it wasn't popular to be in true crime, or <laughs> if that was considered the ghetto of writing um, and now it's very, very big. And someone asked me what, you know, what has changed? And I, podcasting is one of those things that has changed. Um, people are jockeying for being the one to solve the unsolved crime or identify and catch the killer and, uh, or bring a new take to an old crime. And they're jockeying for a position. Now, some, some, many of them get along and support each other, but some are very competitive and they want the audience share. Or they think somebody else's narrative is is incorrect, and they they want to be the ones to replace that narrative. So you are finding a lot of competition right now in the podcasting world, in the writing world, in the documentary world. Anywhere there's entertainment and an audience to be had, you're finding a lot of people jockeying for to be the one, and this becomes a problem. I actually wrote a blog about this where it's, it's, uh, it's called Wisiati. It's W-Y-S-I-A-T-I, -W what you see is all there is. And you're getting people to, trying to solve these cold cases or link cases with limited ideas and uh, logic and when they can do it, they think they've found the truth. And now they jump out there as the one who has solved this crime. And that's why we have 300 Jack the Ripper suspects and, you know, half a dozen or more Zodiac suspects. And because each person owns the crime because they think they've solved it. But what but they've used only what they have. And it's not necessarily the whole story because we're constantly discovering new things. So is that, that's a bad thing or is that a good thing to, for people to be thinking and having well, these I think, discussions? I think they need to be aware of it. That, and I wish police officers were aware of it because they do similar things where they, they jump to conclusions, they wanna get a case solved quickly. Hmm. They think that they've collected a certain amount of evidence and that's all there is to collect. So that's all there is to the story. That's not necessarily true. <laughs> so I think I think the cognitive error, Wiziati, what you see is all there is, is a problem. But it's good for us to know about it. And it's good for people who want to think their way through these crimes to be alert to the potential that they're falling into this trap. And I think you saw a very good documentary, and that was the I think it's called Crime Scene, the Hotel Cecil or something like yes, that. Yes, Cecil Hotel. I had uh, one of the police hotel. officers on my show from that. Right. It, and as you saw, all these true, true crime junkies got into the fray as, as what really happened there. And they identified a suspect and they harassed that person. And they knew that right. she had been murdered. Yeah. Uh, and, and that person was driven almost to the point of suicide. Turns out totally innocent. He had nothing to do with it, but they had worked their way into logic and what has to be true based on the evidence, all of that mm -hmm. in air quotes. Um, 
and they and they were all wrong. All yeah. Of them. But don't you think sometimes it is good for these uh, podcasters or authors and things to shine a light on cases that were kind of ignored, like the Golden State Killer? That was a uh, Patton Oswald's wife. Kind of, I think she wrote the book, or I can't. I think it was a book well, that that yeah, shine, shine the light Paul on that. Holes. It was Paul Holes who did that. Okay. I don't want to. She brought attention to it, and she brought attention to the potential that the uh, these three different crime sprees were linked. Yeah, uh, and she named the Golden State Killer, but it was really the work done by Paul Holes that that identified d'angelo as the killer it was the genealogical dna evidence and he took a chance on something that had never been tested before so he's really got to get the credit for that but no but your point is and well taken uh, is the other end of the spectrum of let's keep the light on these cases so these victims don't get forgotten so that somebody's there and and in m many cases because the light is on the case new evidence surfaces somebody broke up with their boyfriend and now they're ready to tell mm -hmm. on on them or a girlfriend uh, or, um somebody said well the police never asked me this but i do know about blah 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 so new things surface new technologies can be used to look at older cases and and so yes the podcast world is helping with that that's um, all I try to do is just shine a light. I don't, I'm not trying yeah. to solve anything. <laughs> I no, but, but anything, I mean, but I like I'm talking to, to you say, guys and getting yeah, you. Like what yeah. I'm trying to say is you, to your original point about the TikTok yeah. world and narcissism is what's, what can be a great tool also nurtures some dark mentality where you get competition, you get people jumping in to harass suspects um, like with the CISA hotel mm. case, yeah. you get people deciding that they own the case and shoving everybody else out. So as in every human endeavor, mm -hmm. you'll get the noble, reasonable things and you'll get the darker, um, nastiness. Well, and it seems like the most outlandish things will get the biggest press. I mean, you had like, you had Alex Jones saying Sandy Hook was a, uh, Right. Was, a, was a total hoax. And I mean, that thing, just the press, then people knocking on the doors of the victims. I mean, it's terrible things. So yeah, you got to be careful right. what you say. And that, I think that was just clearly for attention and to be outlandish. And, and unfortunately, it seems like the outlandish stuff goes to the top of these algorithms on social media and such. It does. And it also raises emotions in, in ways that attract people. They And it seems to express what they already had a suspicion about and now somebody has put it into words and yeah that makes sense most conspiracies operate off of logic people think logic is the same thing as truth it isn't it's just a tool to put together your thoughts to make them sound coherent but if you start with false premises you land with false premises <laughs> and no matter how much logic you use mm -hmm. but people don't seem to understand that logic it, it, it feels good to make a logical case so it, it's the truth. That's how they understand it. That's not the case. That's, and we struggle with that as college professors trying to get people to do critical thinking that just because you can make a logical case doesn't mean you're right. So how, yeah, it, explain yeah, that because you're, you're, you have a, a, a PhD in philosophy and you taught logic. So Explain right. that, uh, the critical thinking. What, you know, I mean, obviously you can't tell me everything, but like a basic critical thinking. How can people distinguish between BS, conspiracy theory, and some conspiracy theories I think are interesting and fun, but I know that they're conspiracy theories and there's, they're, they're, there's no conclusive evidence that they're true. Well, unfortunately, we're in an age where evidence doesn't matter. Uh, all, there are alternative facts, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Emotion outweighs <laughs> thinking your way through the evidence emotion outweighs it and i've heard politicians say the emotion the emotion part is more important it's not that's where we get misled more often than not um but then you, they'll hear me say something well logic is not the the key to truth it is a it is a method and it can still lead you in the wrong direction uh, and so they're going to hook onto that. Well, it's not about making a logical case either. Um, no, but it is about facts. And there are facts that you can bring to bear to corroborate things. But sometimes those facts can be slippery in terms of 
they're ambiguous, so you can take several interpretations off of them. That's how conspiracies work, is they'll start with, a, with kernels that people understand that are familiar to them, and they'll build their big idea from that, and they'll keep going back to the kernel to, to, to re reinforce, we know this to be true, and out of that springs this other thinking. It's, it's hard to, I mean, I, I don't want to name any particular conspiracy because I want to live, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it, you don't have to look very far to see how, how absolutely grandiose they can get and, and, uh, and the emotions there to keep it in place. And you get one person after, and I have friends who believe some of these things. And the only thing I can do is go, wow, <laughs> whoa. Well, what about here? I'll give you an example. I'll take, get your take on this one. The staircase. Have you seen that new? I mean, there's like three documentary. I think there's the real documentary. And then there's the, the acting one that they just came out on Netflix. And now they're saying there was this, this theory of a, uh, was it a bird or a bat or something? An owl. There? That theory has owl. always been there. That, that okay. theory has always been there. Well, what is your thought about that whole start. case? I mean, from that guy start. seems like he killed her. Like it seems black and white to me. And there was blood. It's splatter. not black and white. It's not. It's no. Okay. And also the, what you called the real one was made by a person, as I understand it, having an affair with him. Right, so, right. you know, how real is, <laughs> there's <Yeah>. emotion, <laughs> there's, there's bias in that. Yeah. Inevitably. Um, so th whatever the real one is, who knows, but um, there always was the owl theory. They just did not give credence to it because they thought, so what, there's an owl feather in here. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, but I actually am glad somebody kind of picked up on that one because I always thought that was kind of <laughs> interesting, unusual theory. And she did have marks in her scalp that were like uh, a claw, huh. claw marks that really weren't explained by her hitting the stairs the way they, and we do know that several people on the prosecution team, one of them lied about uh, his experience and the evidence right. that he did. So we know, yeah. and so he's out of the picture. Another one's lied about his credentials. So he's out of the picture. Uh, the, the coroner, there were all kinds of issues with her. You know, so, so when you start to pick, to pick apart that, that idea or, you know, the, the theory that they had and you pick apart some of their so-called experts, whoa, <laughs> that, there's a problem with that case. No doubt about it. It isn't as, as simple as it seems. And in part because of the way it was investigated and reconstructed. Now, so I, I the, happen yeah. to have been, known the people on the defense side, who the, the criminalists who are involved and in some of the, what they did in their lab and whatnot. And they did find flaws with the prosecutor's idea. They did show, but the jury was invested emotionally anti this man having affairs with men who's married and all that so there's no getting past that i don't care how good of a case you make with your evidence there's no getting past entrenched bias and emotion so it's more problems with the the case and proving it rather than yeah. the, on both sides it, yeah on both sides definitely yeah. So I, I don't know. I'd like, I haven't seen the scripted series. I'd like to just. Oh, the acting that. is really, Colin Firth is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the owl theory is interesting and it was part of it right away. There was somebody who, who wrote an entire treatise about the owl, um, but it was ignored at the time. Yeah. No, I mean, I had to laugh at some of the recreations where she slips like eight times and hits her. I mean, it was, it seemed a little silly, but. Uh, well, I have the crime scene photos and I'm telling you, there is a lot of blood for the scenario that the prosecutor built and his blood expert hardly tested it. So that's a problem. Yeah. And that's what you, that's what you do. You look at a lot of these things yeah. and, and try to figure out what happened. And, and I have my students do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. We set wow. up crime scene scenarios and the the red herrings are there, the the evidence is set up. They have to not just observe, but think about who they are as observers psychologically. What are they are they the type of person who has a high need for closure, for example? So they'll jump to conclusions right away. Are they the kind of person who will look at things and, and in their spotlight of focus will not see other things? Um, like, for example, I had one where there was a, a guard dog 
in in the scene this is a real case the dog was was locked up in the garage so even though the family was afraid they kept their guard dog locked up and i had two, two of them went through the whole house and, and they go so the dog ran away it, the dog is right there. it was a big stuffed rottweiler it's right there right in hmm. front of you they didn't hmm. see it Wow. They had already assumed the dog ran away. And so they did not see right in front of them. So I talk a lot about the, the quirks of observation and of cognition, the cognitive errors, the psychological states that can be part of an, an investigator. And if an investigator does not know themselves, um, they will miss, they'll have blind spots in the way they approach a crime. Um, they might jump to conclusions and fail to see the, all, some of the evidence is there. They might co have confirmation bias and only see what works with the theory they're forming, the hypothesis they're forming. That's a problem. And many cases have gone off the rails for that and innocent people convicted. Yeah, that's not a good thing. I'd be a terrible juror because I, I almost always think the person's guilty. I'm almost always Ooh, going, if they're arrested, they have enough evidence. <laughs> yeah, I always got, I don't know. Like, I just, I watch a lot of those forensic files. I'm like, look, they got the blood splatter. They got the DNA. Like, this is an open and shut case. But I'm sure, yeah, there's little uh, things well, like the that. Forensic, even forensic files. I mean, I've done stuff with them. And, and yeah, they've yeah, been saw, wrong on some of the yeah. cases. Well, um, that, but the, the third case was one of them, apparently, that they were, because they said the blood splatter on that one. That, that There was no way he had to have been hitting for the splatter to come on his shorts like that. But I guess maybe they were wrong. They could be wrong if they did not do the testing of the blood on the wall. And, and um, that's a problem. Yeah. You can't just make assumptions by looking at it. You have to do some testing. And they and uh, I think it was Dwayne Deber, I think it was his name, didn't test, even though he claimed to have done so. And then it turned out other cases were problematic of his. Do you think we're getting better at uh, uh, being with the evidence and the DNA and all this stuff, we're getting bit more accurate in those kinds of things in terms of uh, convictions and, and whatnot, though. Well, but again, everything has a story. Everything has the potential for bias mm -hmm. and interpretation. No matter what the facts are, um, you still have to build your your reconstruction, and that will. If if you're an attorney, if you're the prosecutor versus the defense attorney that story is going to look different and it's going to make the evidence look different. Mm -hmm. And it also sometimes that, there's, yeah. there's, sometimes there's nothing you can do. Like let's say somebody comes in and confesses to the whole thing and it exactly matches and you're the defense attorney. What are you going to do? Well, I'd probably go for an insanity defense or something like that. Now you're in the arena where you can really twist things around in terms of mental state, but you can't do much with that evidence. If the person said, I, yes, I did the, I put the rope around her neck, I blah, 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 blah. Um, there's not much you can do unless you find the person who put him up to doing this, right? So now you pan back and now you have a whole new scenario where the guy isn't the killer, but he's afraid of the guy who is, or mm -hmm. that's his son, so he's going to take the fall. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that, most of these crime shows use those twists, but yeah. some of those are real, real twists on real cases. Or what if they put DNA in a crime scene? Like what if somebody plant, is that a real thing that could happen? That's yes. kind of scary. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Or you happen to be there. So your DNA was there. It doesn't make you the killer. Right. Yeah. No, there's a lot of scary things like that. So uh, with BTK though, gosh, like I remember one time I was on a jury. Uh, it was before I didn't get picked for it, but it, they said this guy, uh, was accused of killing. I mean, I just got chills being in the same room as him. Was uh, would you ever? Did you have that when you first started talking to these killers? I mean, I, I know with BTK it was on the phone, but when you're ever like in the same room, did you at first get chills? And well, things? I, I went to the prison, but oh, you did. He, I mean, he wasn't the first serial killer I'd talked to. So yeah, probably the very very first letter I got from a serial killer is what you're getting at. at okay. Uh, the very first time I received a letter from a serial killer. I looked at the envelope and thought, oh, that is just creepy. <laughs> right? yeah. And yeah, it had an aura. It had an aura, a contagion of, of something corrupt. And if I touched it, what would it, you know what I mean? It's that's superstitious, but a lot of people do that. I have people who re refuse to touch anything BTK has sent me. 
they can't because they think it's going to somehow invade them. Huh. Um, and, and, and frankly, the very first time I got a letter from a serial killer, I felt like, uh, I don't know if I want to open this. But there had been years between that and actually talking with Raider. So by the time mm. I'm talking with him, I'm not disturbed. I did, I, I did go to the prison, but in, they had him in one room and me in another with a monitor. So it, it's not even, even the glass partition that you typically see on these TV shows. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't even that. So it was much easier to talk on the phone because there weren't guards around listening in on everything. Yeah, yes, the, the calls are recorded, but it's not like the same as, you know, somebody's right behind you at the door listening to everything you're saying. Right. So it was most effective to talk on the phone. Yeah, because he was scared of the guards hearing. So he t he spoke in code like I mean, he's already convicted and guilty. So what is, what is he worried is going to happen? Oh, it's more that they're going to take things and sell them on the Internet, which they did, which they were doing. Oh, like, like, plus he wasn't really supposed to be working with me on this. Oh, he's not. There, there were sort of two ideas. Now, first of all, this was all sanctioned by the victim's family trust. Okay. There was a consortium. Right. When this all started was five years before I got involved, where an, another person wanted to write a book and the, the victim's families got together, hired a lawyer, sued her um, because they didn't want her or him making any money off of their victim's pain or what's that, whatnot. She then wa wanted to deliver it all to them, um, whatever proceeds there were, but by then damage had been done. And by the time I saw her on, on Facebook and said, whatever happened to your book, she asked me, would you take it over? Well, the, the arrangement was already made. The, the, you know, I would take my expenses, but the majority of the money is going to the victim's families. So there's one contingent of people who supported that and thought that was a good idea. There's going to be a book. There had already been numerous books about the investigation and the investigators. Um, there is going to be a book with this guy one way or another. So if they could keep some control over what it was about, that's what they wanted. And they liked that I wanted to use it for um, getting benefiting forensic psychology, criminology, and law enforcement, and as well as them. So that way they, it gave them some control, but that didn't mean everybody was in support of this. Certainly law enforcement wasn't in support of it. The DA initially wasn't, she was a friend of mine before I even got involved. I did convince her it was a worthwhile thing to do. So then she was supportive, but there were people in the community who thought this should have never happened. There are people who think that once someone commits a crime like this, they should suffer in hell the rest of their lives. But I'm telling you, he's not suffering. He's busy. He corresponds with people all over the world. They give him money. They give him gifts. He, he probably has more attention now than he ever had in his life. Um, yes, really? he misses his family. Yes, he would rather be free, but... He's not suffering in hell. <laughs> so and, he's living in that a, isn't what happens. He's living in a 12 by 8 concrete cell. He doesn't have a cellmate. Does is he able to interact with the other prisoners at all or? No. 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 So he how does he be in just general population because he's a, a he's famous, he would be a target. He also okay. is manipulative. So how, so he can talk to people on the phone and is he allowed internet and stuff or cable TV? He does, or? He, no, he, no, no internet, but he can watch TV. He's okay. got a TV in his cell and he, and whatever cable the prison has, he can get access to, but he doesn't have the internet. Okay. But people can text him. He, they, they have tablets in prison now where <laughs> you can make your commissary orders okay. digitally and, and uh, he can get texts and he can get videos from people. He can't send, he can text out. You have to pay for it, just like you have to pay for the calls. But hmm. um, yeah, it's moving in that direction. Is it, he's, is, are the messages of those messages monitored and, and such? No. No. Okay. Well, I mean, they're on the tablet. They could be if you, there's digital tracks. Yeah. They Weird. could be just like the phone calls are recorded, but who's sitting there listening to every prisoner's phone call? So is he happy because now he's getting all this attention and fame? Is that, that kind of what he wanted all along? He wanted fame. He is, uh, to some degree, he's always happy when he sees his name in print. That's always a big thing for him. Um, but 
No, I mean, nobody is happy who wants to be out and about and making their own life decisions and eating the food they want to eat. Mm -hmm. So nobody's happy like that. But given the circumstances, I mean, he's not having a terrible life how the way people wish that he was. Interesting. And he doesn't he doesn't have nightmares or guilt or feel remorse for any of the things he, he's not that's not torturing him. No, it never he never had nightmares like that. He's right. he's he does regret hurting his family, especially his wife, ex wife. He does have regrets, but that's not the same as remorse. Okay, yeah, I'm glad you brought it. I was going to ask you about the wife. So you say in the book the wife caught him in bondage one time, twice, and or twice. Okay, and the wife read a book about it and talked to like a person at the church or something, and then she just seemed to accept it. Oh, this is just the way he is or no, something? No, 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 no. It was more, I uh, either have to leave you and get a divorce, which is not okay, okay. In, within her religious idea, or I will accept it, but we will, you will never do this again. We will not talk about it. It wasn't, wasn't like, oh, okay. okay. No, I think she was horrified by it. But um, the only other option was we have to separate, and she didn't want to do that either. She had two kids. Yeah. And so she's never been interviewed. She, do you think she's read the book or watched uh, the series? I can't really talk about her. I, okay. I, you know, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you think, um, or just in general, are there signs and clues that, I mean, it's always shocking to me when they, when these serial killers get caught and, you know, they have family members, they have children, they have neighbors and friends. And everyone seems to be so surprised. Is there is there signs or clues that you may be married to a serial killer, or you, you know, like that people could pick up on? Or well, they're not going to be distinguished from you. May be married to somebody who's having an affair, <laughs> or a con artist, or a rapist. They're not going to be distinguished that way, because they're they're pretty good at. First of all, there's two things going on. One is the offender wants to keep their behavior secret so they've worked up a pretty good shield but secondly nobody married to a killer or or the daughter or son or father or mother of a killer wants to believe their relative is a serial killer one of the best books on this subject is jeffrey dahmer's father mm. who had numerous things that suggested that his son was not okay and he was able to explain them all away and even at one point, he was holding the head of a victim in a box. And, and Jeff managed to persuade him to not open the box because it contained pornography. Oh, that's right. I, think <laughs> I remember seeing yeah. that interview. Yeah. And he did not open the box. So it had to have stink, right? Yeah, um, you're right. I didn't think um, of that. The and, smell. But that's what happens. It's a cognitive um, safety net in a way you can always look at whatever this developing kid for example is doing and explain it away as a, a phase they'll get away from it oh they just like uh they're just experimenting with animals because they're going to be a biologist or they're just experimenting with with um explosives because they're going to go into the atf you know things like that mm -hmm. there's always ways to explain why something some behavior is not a serious aberration and especially but, okay. if you have an investment in staying married uh, like you don't have a job and you've got kids and what are you going to do without this person um, or that person abuses you anyway and you've just learned to live with it and there's so many cases it's hard to kind of generalize about it but there are two things always at work the, the killer and their shield how they build that because Raider went to church and had a job mm. and, you know, nothing about him suggested serial killer. And then there's the person who has cognitive ways of reframing any given behavior to be more benign than it really is. Same thing can be said for the development of people into mass murderers. We see, we see much more in the background of a mass murderer than a serial killer. And yet people don't say anything. They don't want to believe this person really could go into an elementary school and shoot somebody up. Right? Yeah. 
Okay, so there are so, so so you feel like there are red flags with the so the difference between a serial killer and mass murder. Serial killer is like multiple incidents, whereas a mass murder is usually just one it's large one, incident yeah. like that. And a mass murder typically is is um, provoked with anger, uh, revenge fantasies, punishment, uh, entitlement. There there are a number of things that they they tend to share in common. Unlike serial killers who have diverse motivations, diverse things that they're operating on and diverse developmental trajectories is much harder with somebody like that than with a mass murderer. So what are the red flags? Because that's something that I feel like is one of the problems with the mass murderer thing right now, the mass shooters and things is that um, I know the latest one, I think it was the Uvalde, he texted some girl and said, I'm going to do it and sent like a picture of guns. And she was like, huh? Like she was clueless. Could we educate the public? Everybody, I feel like not just kids, but like all all people on some of these red flags. I feel well, like I, maybe I'm just going to give a shout out to uh, Peter Langman's book, Warning Signs, because not only does he have okay. he's probably the world's expert on school shooters. Oh. He has a website with all of the cases and all of the documents. Uh, I need to have him everybody. on the podcast then. Yeah. Um, and he shows at the end of each of these chapters, those, those possible incidents that were stopped by somebody who saw the behavior and did something about it. So even though we will have cases where somebody says, well, I didn't take that seriously just because he posted it on Facebook or whatever. We'll always have those. We are having more and more and more of the ones that were stopped before they happened because somebody did recognize the warning signs and said, I see them in this person. And police were able, or counselors or teachers or somebody was able to intervene and prevent it from happening. So that book is fabulous for not just educating you on the warning signs but showing you the people who made the difference okay yeah i want to read that that sounds fascinating so if we without getting to the gun thing whether we have more guns at schools to to combat the killers but if we magically somehow if they're found which i don't think is possible but if he somehow took every gun out of america and the cartel couldn't have them and so these killers these mass shooters did not have guns okay so they they do not have access to a gun they do they can't get a gun would they still have that urge, though, to kill, to do a mass killing? Would they get in a semi and run people over? Would they poison water? Would they uh, yes. do Molotov cocktails? Like poison, poison water knives have been used in mass murders in other countries that don't have access to guns. Uh, explosives um, certainly has has been the in the weapons of mass murderers. Cars. Uh, fixing a plane so they go down, kill a lot of people. Um, yeah, they still want to do it. They still, they, they're, they're turning anger outward. And, and, because, and I'm going to put this on the media because the media gives them fame. Some of them are motivated to make sure they have the highest victim toll. Not all of them, but some of them have actually made those statements. They want to be famous. They've seen every, someone else in the news who did this. They're going to do it too, but they're going to outdo Columbine, for example. There are multiple. Another thing about Peter Langman's site, he, make, he takes Columbine from 1999, Littleton, Colorado, and shows how many of our, our school shooters since those days have cited Columbine as their inspiration. And there are lots of them. Either right. they... I saw them do it. They were cool. I'm going to do it too, or I'm going to outdo them. Wow. Yeah, no, I, it's interesting like that. I, that was a big one because I remember I was in college and I was studying psychology and that's what made me wanted to be a counselor. Cause I thought, Oh, I could, I could help, you know, those kinds of kids mm -hmm. like that and uh, try to prevent that. It seems like we haven't figured out the answer to this. So we have think... though. I mean, I, I would recommend that book. So why don't so why isn't that more widespread? Why isn't that something the media reports on and said, "Here's the red flag." Why don't they teach that in schools? Why don't they? Uh, we do. That in, like we for every it. student, every student, every kid in high school gets these. You know, every everybody no, knows. They don't. So we all know because I don't even think I know what all the red flags are. But the ones I named probably are don't surprise you at all. 
Mm -hmm. entitlement, anger, the sense of being punitive, wanting to be famous because they've seen somebody else get fame from doing this, um, having a grudge list. Those those are all logical things that would would right when you come together and then they have they are amass their weaponry. They they typically will tell, especially if they're younger. Moreover, the younger ones will tell someone or warn someone, "Don't go to school today," uh, or "You're going to see me in the paper." Um, uh, more younger ones have a mental illness attached than the older ones do, but even so, it's not it's not more than fifty percent. And yet, you see the headlines: "Oh, they're all mentally ill." No, they're not. No, they're not actually. They're angry, and they want someone to notice them, and they want to punish somebody. And these are the things that, that make. And they watch other people do it, and they believe in their fantasy life. They're taking satisfaction from it, even if they're they have a suicide plan in place. They're imagining the headlines and the TV shows and the news reports. That's all very satisfying in their fantasy life. It would never ever become that satisfying if they carried it out, got arrested, and ended up in in prison. Ask those who have who did survive. There, they'll tell you nothing. It was nothing like the fantasy life. Nothing. Right. It sounds miserable after now they're spending their life in prison or they're, they're, they've they done the suicide thing and they're dead. But I mean, you're spending your Christmas and your birthdays in jail. I missing mean, missing everything, yeah. missing everything, yep. especially for the young kids that are 18 that haven't lived. I mean, Raider got arrested what when he was in his 50s or 60s. So, I mean, he had lived most of his life anyways. But these kids right. that are 17, 18, yeah. they're going to miss their whole life. To, for one shooting incident. So do there's then a, they... there's, yeah, there's a great interview online, easy to find with Kip Kinkle, who was the Springfield, Oregon shooter when he was 15. He expected to die. He thought the police would shoot him. They didn't. Mm. He ended up in prison. Mm. Um, and he has been talking to a journalist and it's a really great interview about his case and, and the issues he was facing at the time. And he killed his parents and then he went to school and started shooting. Um, and and his reflections on that, what his life has been like, that was that was um, 1998. So he's been in prison a, a while, and the things that he has to say about it, and what what he understands about himself, I think I think it's useful to read interviews like that and to then teach it. Um, I have my students read it, yeah. so that they so that they get it. it th this is not a solution to anyone's problem. Right, but the, the, it seems like that approach is not very widespread to with the media. No, it's probably but. not. Well, most people don't think, don't want to think about dark things like this. You know, it's they just want to move on. But you know, and and it doesn't necessarily help to keep it in the news because then you're just you're inspiring more people who want to be in the news, who want to be the one that everybody's talking about. And what about besides the, the the regular like the news media and stuff? What about like movies and things? Like I know Raider was inspired by House of Wax and some other movies and TV shows. <laughs> and they say, um, I don't know. I heard this the other day that kids are I, I can't remember the numbers. Some astronomical like ha have seen two hundred thousand violent acts on TV and movies by the time they're fifteen or some something crazy like that. I'm probably saying that statistic wrong, but. I mean, does that play a part? What, what is there something that we? I mean, on the same time, I I love watching action movies and horror movies, and I don't I don't want to kill anybody. So why does it affect some people differently? Right, and me too. I grew up on all that stuff, and I'm, I'm not going to say I'm okay, but <laughs> look at what I write. But <laughs> well, you haven't killed anybody that we know of. If you did, you certainly um, really know how to hide it. So it's all about the developmental trajectory what is hitting any given person at any given time in their development? What, what's their physiology? Kip Kinkle, for example, was a scrawny kid who was unathletic while his parents were athletic. His sister was a high achiever and gregarious and popular and athletic, and he couldn't match up with any of that stuff. So he had so much going against him. Um, and what made him feel powerful was knowledge of explosives. Hmm. Now, he could have stopped with that. He could have left that. That's a fantasy, made him feel good. But 
he he then got himself into trouble and his father was calling up a military school and that and that's it i got i got i got to do something and he shot his father cuz oh. he had the he had the gun and the ammunition he had always had, had that incident never happened perhaps he never would have done anything yeah or why couldn't you know, oh, you really like explosives? Like he could have gone into demolition, right? Well, that's I mean, what he told his parents he wanted to do. And he could have. There you go. But that incident, that's what I'm trying to say. And yeah. I'm not blaming the father by, no, by no, no, no. What I'm trying to say is given the lead up to, and that it wasn't snapping, it was a developmental process such that a certain thing happened at a certain time that scared him and he reacted strongly Mm -hmm. um and once having killed the father had to kill the mother and then put his school shooting plan into place which he had gotten from watching news of other school shootings um so it's about what it is about what they're exposed to to some extent but how they absorb it how they perceive it how they perceive their own life story you know you'll take three siblings and have you know all the same exposures to the family environment but different perceptions yeah so one well, because... might feel resentful one might feel privileged one might be indifferent you're not going to be able to control certain of those factors um and so that makes it hard there isn't no cookie cutter approach to this it makes it difficult um and if somebody is in fact at risk for potential future violence at that age you're going to need to call on family counselors. I mean, we could we could take the case of the kid in Michigan who who did the school shootings after his parents supplied the gun. And uh, do you remember this case? Was a couple Which years one? Ago. The one in Michigan. There's so many now. I can't do no, well, the, the one in Michigan. I can't remember. I can't think of the name of the school district, but they had a team in place okay. for this purpose. And they left them out when the parents were called in and told your son is drawing these violent images. Uh, we're, we're nervous about him. You need to take him out and get him some counseling. And they refused to do it. And it mm-hmm. turned out they had given him the gun that he used as a gift. They had made fun of the concerns the school district had. Then they took off. They ran after he was arrested. They ran. Mm. And they're now the only, this is the first case the parents are being prosecuted to. Wow. Because they were directly complicit, first in supplying a weapon, second in not not giving him. uh, Apparently there was some neglect. I'm not sure about that, but um, not taking him out of school. And but the school is complicit in not using their team of people who are trained in Mm -hmm. these red flag behaviors. That team was left out of the equation. Hmm. So that's it. And I use that case in my class because what an interesting study of multiple factors that go into these incidents. And that kid, in a way, never had a chance. He was looking for help and no resources were there for him, even though they were available. Yeah. That's, so that's a problem. That's why, definitely. Is, why could that have even ever happened? It did. So it sounds like what you're saying is if, if people are trained and if more more aware, there are red flags for a majority of these things. For this for these kinds of the school shooters, the, shooters. the young young ones, and for the mass murderers, that is not the same as the serial killers. The serial killers. Although this, yeah. there will there will in some cases be red flags. And yeah. if they are anger motivated rather than sexually motivated they will already have anger. They will already have had domestic abuse. They will already have had incidents in their background that show their anger and it's out of control. And that anger then emerges as murder. We do have anger compelled serial killers. The ones that are sexually compelled though, have already learned how to keep their sexual perversions under the shield. So people don't really see, because because it's unacceptable. So people don't see what they're doing. And so they've already learned many habits of secrecy Hmm. in order for people not to understand what's going on with them. If they're good at it, which they're not all good at it, if they're good at it, people are not going to see behaviors. But if they're not very good at it, there'll be things like, you know, they, they hurt the family pet or cut off its tail or hanged it in a tree or something, or they, um, you know, left pornography around or, you know, there are things, but though any of those things are easy to 
reinterpret in a benign way. Oh, that's that's just a phase. Is that because that's bit... that's what serves the family unit. Is that though? Is there people that harm animals as kids that don't go on to be serial killers? Because I know that's a big thing. Multiple. The okay. majority. Majority people, don't. <laughs> majority don't. Okay. Correct. Are, and every time is... I see that, oh, that kid's a budding serial killer. It's like, no, they're not. Okay. So the majority that is a, do not. It is a jump, but most a lot of serial killers did harm animals. As... And not all did. Not all. Yeah. So yeah. it's hard to make that a necessary or sufficient condition. Right. There's no perfect formula for any of this stuff. There is none. There's yeah. no profile of a serial killer. As the FBI says repeatedly, stop trying to make there be a, there's no pl blueprint no. against which to measure people to see are they or aren't they. We don't have that. No. And it, it is interesting to study though, and, and to look at it as, as, as you know, this is your life's work. It's, it's fascinating. And hopefully there's nothing wrong with me that I'm so interested in it because it's just so, <laughs> so fascinating. Well, I mean, it's fascinating because it's a, it's an aspect of the human mind that is difficult to understand how yeah. did they develop in this way and why did they want to stay this way? <sighs> and especially because it could, it could lose them everything that they have if they're older and they have wife and family, like, the Golden State Killer and yeah. and Dennis Rader and a few others I can name. Um, why do they put all that at risk? Well, because it's really hot. The urge it's, is so great yeah. that it, it supersedes the fear of going to jail for the rest of your life. It's not just the urge, it's the experience. It's so raw. It's so, um, they, they talk about it as being this, this is the life force right here. And in fact, you if you read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that, that phrasing is in that book but from the 19th century. When I'm Mr. Hyde, that is when things are exaggerated, heightened. My senses, I, I feel so powerful. I feel like nothing can stop me. That's heady. That's addicting. Scary stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I, I always end each episode with a charity. And you had, a, you had three. You had the, uh, so tell me about the Cold Case Foundation. Um, that is uh, an organized effort by a number of experts who work on cold cases to try to solve them and, and work on John and Jane Doe cases um, that might not even have names. So they want to try to, first of all, to identify them and give them their name. And then, and then if they died by murder, to identify the person who did it. Okay, so that one is one, and then Women for DeSales, they, they fund student projects? Yeah, that's at my university, Women for DeSales. DeSales All right. money, not, not one bit goes to any administrative fees. Every single donation goes to support student projects and student travel so that they can maybe take a trip where they build a house in some in other country for people who can't, who don't have any means or they learn a skill or they, you know, something. So everything that through this particular organization goes directly to support students. Okay. And then the Bethlehem Mounted Police? The Bethlehem Mounted Police. I used to take care of the horses. <laughs> I love that. That was oh, fun. You still have time to take care of horses with all the stuff that you're doing? <laughs> I used to. I okay. spent four years doing that and then helped them by, with fundraising, I helped put together calendars and things they could sell. So that's, that's another one that I support. Okay. And then oh, I wanted to, before we, it's not a charity, but I, I did want uh, to uh, pitch your show that you, are you still doing the murder house flip? Yeah, show? it's coming out this. second season. It's I August 12th. Really in this. We have six houses, including the Jody Arias house. Oh, that's in, that's in, is that in Arizona? That's I'm in yeah, Arizona. Arizona. That, she's big yeah. in Arizona. Yeah. And, oh. and the house had not been thoroughly redone before. Okay. So we, we went in and, and our crew, our designers redesigned the spot where Travis was brutally slaughtered and dragged to the shower and none of that had been renovated before. So how, how much do you gut it? Do you just turn that into a completely different room or do you just? Yeah, okay. it's, it's always the murder site. The idea of murder house flip is a murder occurred in a house or yard because <laughs> because one time we did a yard where seven bodies had been had been buried and they didn't really want to change the house but they did want 
you know, a better yard and they mm -hmm. got one. So we, we will go into the murder area, which has an aura of creepiness. It makes them avoid the place or makes the house depressing. Um, and we'll completely redo that area. And also often give them more landscaping or a great backyard or something. They get more than just a, a makeover of the murder spot. But that certainly is. There was one that had a bathroom, the Blue Murder House had a bathroom where the man had dismembered his wife and he was caught cooking her parts on the stove. So we got, <laughs> we got several areas of the house here that need attention, but also we painted the outside so it wasn't the blue murder house anymore. And it, was, it became a sweet seaside cottage, white cottage that didn't look anything like the blue murder house. So who's buying these houses? Is it people that kind of get off on that there was a murder there or is it they get a discount so it's cheaper? So it's cheap. It's cheap buying? Yeah, the, the whole idea of the show was these are stigmatized properties. And so they're much lower in value than they should be because a murder happened there. But it's not the house's fault. Yeah. And that that value can be restored by healing the murder spot. And that's Did you important. have you written books on uh, paranormal and ghosts? Yes, uh, I have. Yeah, so and I, we I, had I we had two paranormal incidents in these houses. So. Oh, really? Is that yeah, on the show? And, in fact, in fact, two of the murder stories, the people told us they had experienced ghostly activity around the murder site. So you think the remodeling, though, uh, Ch changes that do you do they do you bring in a priest or something to, to do a um, saging to... yeah, they, saging. yeah in fact our our original pitch was um stage sage cell <laughs> 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 but it turned out we were going to go buy these houses and flip them we were going to make them over okay uh, and so they sometimes the owner buys it and finds out there was a murder in it yeah, um, they just buy because it it's a great price. So, and then they find out, oh my God, this is what they happened have to here. disclose that, right? I think like uh, up to three years, and after that, no. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's how people buy these houses without okay. knowing. Oh, what channel is this going to be on? It's on the Roku network, the streaming oh. service for Roku. If you have a Roku device, you yeah, have a Roku, Roku network. So it's free, and it's and it's one of the Roku originals. Awesome. Well, very cool. You got a lot of stuff to to. Uh... <laughs> To sell their shows, books, all sorts of stuff. So you'll have to come back. With, uh, maybe I'll read another one of your books and we can talk for another sure. hour. All right. all right. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been a Thanks blast. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you again to Dr. Catherine Ramslin. Fascinating stuff. Uh, again, she has a lot of books you can read, like 70. The BTK one is very interesting and very descriptive. Uh, the show on A&E that's based on that is also very good. And I want to check out that Murder House Flip show. You can follow... Catherine on social media or buy her books, uh, watch some of her TV appearances or donate to the charity she mentioned. And if you enjoyed this episode, uh, make sure to check out some of my other interviews like the one with uh, Thomas Hargrove and the Murder Accountability Project or the episode I just did with Carrie Spencer about sex trafficking. And make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so that you'll be able to catch new episodes. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.